Hello everybody and welcome to the latest episode of Heritage JDM's Car Review. Today Connor and I are here to review a very special car that all you JDMers out there will really appreciate. It's a 1965 Toyota S800, also known as the Yoda Hachi. Only about 3,000 of these cars were made ever and maybe 10% of those remain today. So you're looking at one of 300 and the vast majority of those cars are currently in Japan. So what resides stateside, nobody really knows, but it's probably 10 or less cars. And we are lucky enough to have one in our collection and we're gonna review it with you guys here today. So last winter, in December 2016, I stumbled across a, a post on Facebook from a gentleman in Michigan who was trying to sell his 1965 S800. I immediately responded back, telling him I was ready to buy it sight unseen and I would be there first thing in the morning to pick it up. It's almost impossible to find one of these cars in the United States. It's even more unlikely to find one in the Midwest. So I didn't hesitate to get on the phone and call them and make arrangements to go pick the car up. The next morning, I drove through the snow out to Michigan, picked up this great little car and brought it back. The car was not in as good a shape as it is now, but pretty close. Uh, the floors were rusted out. Uh, it was missing a bunch of odds and ends like windshield wiper arms and door handles and it's still, there's still some of those parts that we're trying to source out. But overall uh, it was a unicorn find, uh, kind of a once in a lifetime type of opportunity, uh, especially knowing that there's maybe 10 of these things running around the United States right now. So this car is so unique, it's a, such an important part of the heritage of Japanese auto manufacturers. It's just going to be really fun to review this car. So next off, you're going to hear from Connor. He's going to give you the history of the car, give you some of the specifics, kind of how this car came to be. After that, we're going to take the car outside. We're going to run it through its paces, see how fast it goes, how it brakes, how it handles. And um, I'm pretty sure we're going to be a little bit surprised by the results. Now here comes Connor with the history of the car. The Toyota Sports 800, or the Yoda Hachi, which is a Japanese short term for Toyota 8, was sold at Toyota dealers across Japan. However, the car was only produced from 1965 to 1969. In 1965, the car went into actual production. The car had aerodynamic styling by Shozo Sato, a designer on loan from Datsun, and Toyota engineer Tatsuo Hasegawa. Hasegawa had been an aircraft designer in World War II, and the resulting Sports 800 was a lightweight and agile machine. Because he was an aircraft designer from World War II, a lot of his ideas and his mentality towards the build of this car was shown in the actual design of the car. The Sports 800 was one of the first production cars featuring a lift-out roof panel, or a target top, predating the Porsche Targa. The aluminum target top could be stored in the trunk when not in use, and this idea proved to be very helpful having a place to store this roof panel. In total, approximately 3,131 units were built by Toyota subcontractor Kanto Auto Works. Only about 10% of these vehicles are known to have survived, most being in Japan. The vast majority of the 3,131 cars were right-hand drive, but some 300 were left-hand drive models, built primarily for the Okinawa market. Okinawa was occupied by American troops, who drove on the left side of the road, which shows why about 300 of these cars were left-hand drive. A very limited of number of left-hand drive cars were used to Toyota to test drive in the U.S., but Toyota made a decision not to import or sell the cars in the U.S. market. An air-cooled 790 cubic centimeter horizontally opposed two-cylinder boxer engine powered this vehicle. It could also reach 100 miles per hour and get 70 miles per gallon, which is amazing even by today's standards. Weight was kept down to 1,268 pounds by using aluminum on selected body panels and thin steel on the unibody construction. For the first few years of production, even the seat frames were made of aluminum, which again shows some of the ideas that Hasajawa brought to the table for the designing of this car. So now for some personal history on how we acquired the Yodahachi. Originally, the Yodahachi, of course, was made in Japan. So our model of this car was made in Japan. It was then shipped to Zimbabwe, Africa, where it sat for a pretty long while, a few years. 
It was then, by the request of the owner of the car, sent to Australia to have restoration done. It was supposed to have a stripped interior and a lot of um, improvements to the car in general. It never was officially restored, and so it was then shipped to Michigan, where we saw it on Bring a Trailer, and then we drove up to Michigan and got it and brought it back to us. It went from Japan to Africa to Australia to the United States. This Yodahachi has been all around the world and now it is here for us. The Yodahachi is widely considered to be the predecessor to the 2000 GT and was Toyota's intro into sports cars. For this and due to the groundbreaking designs, it is a highly collectible car. Now let's get into the walk around and a little tour of what our, ha our car has in store. Okay, so that was the history of the Yodahachi. Now let's take a look at our Yodahachi, kind of go over a little bit of what, what this car is all about. So the first thing you notice, like Connor said, is it's super small and super light and super aerodynamic. This, this car was groundbreaking for the time in terms of just styling. Notice the plexiglass enclosed headlights, very unique style, you didn't see, hard to see that anywhere else ever. Most of these parts are either really thin steel or aluminum which again was very rare that you did that to lighten the weight of the car. At only 45 horsepower, the way you made up for it was by lightening the pounds. So we added a few things to this car. We put new lenses on the, on the lights up here because the other ones were cracked. And we put new fender mirrors on. These are all OEM, which are unfortunately are extremely expensive. We still have a couple more odds and ends that need to get on this car. Uh, if you look at the driver's side, uh, door handle we still have to add, which we have that part in stock. We just need to put it on there. Also, this car was a one of the first Targa tops ever made. Uh, predated, as Connor mentioned, the uh, the Porsche Targa top. But this, what was so cool about this was these tops were designed to pop off and go inside the trunk. If I get it in there. So the target top tucks nicely into the boot of the car, or the trunk of the car, and uh, hardly gets in the way at all. There's still room for your spare tire in there and some odds and ends. Really a, an innovative design for the time. We're missing the bumperettes on the back. I kind of like the styling of the car without the bumperettes, so we, we haven't put them on yet, but we may decide to do that at a later time. We also need to get all four hubcaps. Uh, we only have two of the four hubcaps on this car. You see over here is these seats. Uh, these seats are also made out of aluminum with a lot of aluminum parts and framing. Kind of a airplane design that was used from that engineer that had an aeronautics background. So you kind of see styling cues from the designers that concentrate a lot on weight reduction and aerodynamics. You see a whole lot of airplane kind of theme design. So the car is relatively roomy. I wouldn't say if you were a six foot six guy that you'd want to be in this car, but um, for the size, they did a pretty good job with the space inside the car. Now, when we purchased this car, this whole floor was completely rusted out. It was like a Flintstone mobile, so the feet were touching, touching the ground. So we put new floor pans in. We still have an accelerator pedal in there that we have in stock that we just need to install. So there's a lever in here which will open flaps uh, which will allow air to enter the engine bay. You can pull it to close it, push it to open them, depending on the time of year and how much uh, circulation you want in that engine bay. You know, pretty basic uh, interior amenities here. You've just got your speedometer, uh, you've got your tachometer, you've got uh, your temperature, amps, fuel, uh, and oil pressure. You've got a small map light here, and you've got choke, lights, windshield wipers, parking brake, and your shifter. Uh, it's a four speed on the floor. You've also got a pass through here. So you can, if you have large items that maybe you were going skiing, I guess you could take this thing and throw your skis through the middle and, and you get a little more versatility that way. Underneath the hood, you've got your boxer engine that Connor talked about, air-cooled, dual carburetor. Uh, both of these carbs are brand new OEM. We just sourced those and they cost uh, a pretty penny. Uh, in this area here, we're supposed to be the HVAC equipment. So there was some air handling. It's almost like a cylinder type shape 
piece that went there and that handled it. Um, another interesting thing you can see we, we've got um, a new cylinder, master cylinder here. We did a lot of tuning. But one other thing you can see, I guess the car has obviously been repainted at some point. The original color is kind of right here. It's a silver color. So at some point, we'd like to take this down, sand this all the way back down to the bottom, you know, to the bare metal, and then get it repainted with the factory color. But for now, we'll keep it with the red, enjoy it, drive it, and kind of have some fun with it. So I got some more video here of the interior of the car. Uh, we're gonna redo this interior at some point. Uh, we do have uh, new, new cranks, the windows, we'll do some new door cards. Um, I really like these little, uh, little vents, little hatches from the vent. Just basically just open straight to the outside. I suppose that improves airflow somehow, marginally. Uh, not much going on back here, no rear defrost or any of those uh, fine amenities, but we still have our registration sticker, I believe from uh, Africa, where this thing originated, at least for us, where it originated from. The dashboard still needs a little bit of work. Uh, our gauges, everything works on this except for our RPMs, I believe. And I believe our, our temperature gauge is a little out of kilter, so we need a little bit of work on that. We replace this Toyota symbol, the, the uh, logo, the horn button, which is currently cracked, but the horn does work. Uh, you can see some support beams in here. This is a main uh, support member of the car as well. Um, and you really, right there is where the uh, HVAC is supposed to poke through. Pedals are extremely close together. So right now, this is our accelerator pedal until we install the one that we have. You hear the beautiful sound of that boxer, air-cooled boxer engine. It sounds more like a motorcycle engine, really, which is kind of what it was based off of than a, than a car. Brake pedal, clutch, all extremely close together. Getting your feet, I can, I can easily press them both. for a bigger person. Yeah. Okay, so now we're gonna do some road tests so we can see how this old car handles in a modern day environment. Okay, so we're doing the slalom with the S800. The car shifts really well. It's surprisingly agile for how old this car is. Uh, going through the slalom actually feels really comfortable and easy. Um, you may have to do some relatively large turns with the steering wheel, but otherwise, it's not too bad. Okay, so we just finished up doing the slalom with the S800. Uh, like I said before, it handles amazingly well for how old this car is. And it just feels so agile and nimble. Uh, you feel like you're going twice as fast as you probably really are. It's just so fun, this thing. Um, the rear wheel drive seems to make a difference. Uh, and those really high RPMs that you can put out with this car really makes this a very, uh, very fun, uh, very, visceral experience when you're driving it. I mean, you feel every inch of this car while you're taking it through this the course. It's, it's a ton of fun. Okay, now we're gonna do zero to 60 at the Yoda Hachi. We're, we got two people in the car, so we're not expecting amazing results, but um, I don't have a mile per hour on my, uh, on my gauge here, so I've gotta do 96 kilometers an hour, or it will equate to 60 miles per hour. So we'll see if we can hit it on this straightaway with this little car. There you go. There we go. Oh, she's struggling.
Okay, so we just finished the braking part of our testing. Um, overall, the Yoda Hachi is really not that good at braking. Uh, no analog brakes, of course. Uh, not a lot of great feel for the pedal. Um, you know, I'm starting to get used to it after three or four attempts, so I'm not locking up the back brakes right away. But thin tires, no analog brakes, uh, not superb braking. But it is a light car. It does stop relatively quickly, it seems. But uh, you know, certainly by modern day standards, uh, this would not be considered a really safe car for, uh, in terms of braking. Uh, I'd say, to me, the handling was way better than the braking. Uh, on this car, but it does stop it, so that's something. Okay, okay, come on. <laughs> so that pretty much wraps it up, our review of the 1965 Toyota S800, otherwise known as the Yoda Hachi. In many respects, this car is where it all began for Japanese sports cars. Um, and I think what we saw in our review pretty much illustrates it. Really, a really nimble, fun, exciting car to drive with a lot of uh, really progressive ideas put into it that really shaped what all these cars behind us ended up coming from, or where they all ended up coming from. So, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Stay tuned. In another month, we'll come out with another episode of Heritage JDM's Car Review. For now, we're signing off, and we'll see you guys in a little bit.